I want to thank the organizers of the Asian Conference on Asian Studies in Osaka, Japan for giving me the opportunity to participate in this conference at a distance. This presentation, The Veins of the Earth, DMI in Lawn Community in Late Imperial China, looks at a very interesting concept, traditionally thought of as a feng shui concept, that loosely translated as the veins of the earth, DMI, in the legal culture of late imperial China. There is a need here to historicize the concept of DMI in its proper context, largely because the concept has not come into the political and legal parlance of 20th and 21st century China. And in doing that, we need to understand the role of DMI in the law to appreciate how property, how geography was previously conceptualized in pre-modern China. In recent years, there has been a growing trend both in Chinese history and in legal studies towards a greater critical engagement with geography and spatial categories as cultural constructs rather than objective inalienable categories. Nicholas Bloomley's Law Space in the Geographies of Power challenged legal historians to reject the notion of law as a closed system and move beyond the simple tendency to study the effects of, of law upon space and vice versa, as the two are so invariably intertwined in culturally defined notions of jurisdiction, territoriality, and property boundaries. This is particularly relevant for the field of Chinese history, where historians have skillfully begun incorporating notions of cartography and geography into studies of imperial processes. Yet this trend is almost exclusively focused on the administrative geography of successive regimes established in China. The counties, prefectures, and provinces that constituted and expanded the empire into distant frontiers. But beneath these layers of state administration, local geography, often colored by notions of feng shui, was not irrelevant. Archival legal cases from across the country contain hundreds of cases of boundaries disputes regarding trees that protected deceased ancestors, mountains whose veins, Chinese Mai, protected the sanctity of shrines that in turn protected a village or town, and rivers whose currents protected the fortunes of a family lineage. But by not accounting for the law's acknowledgement of these spatial realities, we run the risk of first neglecting what Jonathan Arco has called the missing metaphor in applying Western legal scholarship to the study of property in pre-modern China, and second, failing to see the application of foreign legal and geographic concepts onto Chinese society following the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911 as a long, difficult process that reworked the local power structures over how boundaries could be defined and recognized by the state. Yet within the, a discussion of critical legal geography in Chinese history, we must address the question of movement. In late imperial China, there were high levels of mobility and movement between regions as a result of demographic pressures. Migration is a huge issue in the history of China. It is, of course, resp responsible for helping to create the China we have today. Sichuan province, for instance, in western China, saw a large population boom during the 18th and 19th centuries, with its population doubling from 20 million to 40 million by the year 1900. Other regions of China, such as Taiwan, similarly saw increased growth during this period. When a family moved to a new area, they had to reestablish their roots in that place, even if they kept in contact with their previous locale. Naturally, they had to purchase and create grave sites for their dead. This process, in turn, transformed local geographies. So what this presentation attempts to do is examine how such migration reworked local geographies. Yet in order to do this, we must differentiate local geography from administrative geography. So just quickly to go over what the administrative map of the state looked like in late imperial China, just to give an example of sticking with Sichuan province. Sichuan province was a border province, and so it consisted of uh, a province of both Han and non-Han communities. I've, di I've differentiated those in the map on the right. Beneath the layer of the province, there existed a circuit, uh, which, was, uh, which was the second highest layer of bureaucratic apparatus. Below that was a prefecture, and finally a county. In a few slides from now, we'll look at, the, uh, look at a case study of an Islamic shrine being established in this county, Longzhong County, which was the base of Baoning Prefecture. 
So there's not a whole lot to say about this, just to give you a base of how the bureaucratic map of the state looked like and to go on to what alternative forms of geography were. But that wasn't the only geography. Uh, in modern China, something known as feng shui, you probably have all heard of, is it's quite famous and it's also very much considered superstition. A qualification which is not extended to Buddhism, Islam, or even traditional Chinese medicine, which shares a great deal of vocabulary with feng shui. Feng shui has had a rough 20th century, but it wasn't always so. As, as I've mentioned before, when we talk about geography in Chinese history, we typically mean administrative geography, but this wasn't the entirety of geography. Once a person starts to think about what geography in its totality meant, though, it is impossible to avoid or separate it from feng shui. For instance, at the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, which was established by an ethnic group from Northeast Asia known as the Manchus, uh, they came in and conquered China. One of the early Qing emperors, the Kangxi Emperor, in order to justify his rule over, or rather the Qing's rule over the country, made an argument that the root of the Tai Mountain, Mount Tai, which is a very famous Chinese mountain, came from Changbaishan, which is a famous mountain in Manchuria that the Manchus considered to be their homeland. He made this argument through feng shui. Again, you could say he made it through geography, but he made it through the feng shui concept of a dragon vein. It was the dragon vein of Changbaishan that fueled the qi of Taishan. Many other geographers in Chinese history are likewise basically feng shui specialists. What you see here, a book, famous book, The Five Keys of Geography, the Di Li Wu Jie, it's a Qing Dynasty, a late imperial text that is, again, seemingly about this concept of geography, Di Li, but is in fact about feng shui. Now, part of the problem is, in modern Chinese, the word Di Li denotes our modern scientific concept of geography. But Di Li, in its original meaning, was in fact a feng shui concept. It meant the principle of the land. And it was a concept that was used by practitioners of yin yang to denote the condition of a land, the condition of a grave site, the condition of a, of a village in relation to a mountain or a water source. It's a very complex system. Now, it's not to say, however, that feng shui was always considered to be good in Chinese history. Just as there were good and bad doctors, local governments, local yamans in China, noted that there were good and bad feng shui specialists. Um, now, this is particularly relevant. This way of thinking about space and the ordering of space is particularly relevant for uh, to the subject of cemetery land, which we'll get to in relation to migration in just a few. So one could ask, well, what was feng shui? Well, feng shui, it wasn't just an empire-wide issue. Uh, it was also a personal family issue. As you can see, the, the chart here on, on the left gives you a sense of how exactly feng shui was conceptualized for a gravesite. By the way, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau, and, and in places in the PRC, people still do this. So it's not totally history. Um, according to traditional Taoist belief, all of the great mountains, uh, water sources, etc., came from the Kunlun Mountains which are today located in Xinjiang in far northwestern China. These were connected through dragon veins into what you could call ancestral mountains. These then connected via dragon veins to a primary mountain where, at the base of which or on which one's grave would be located. This, uh, this grave site should be next to a water source, uh, which was very important. The presence of trees also was thought to have protected the gravesite. What you see on the right here is a map from, uh, from Ming, China, from an area within China, Huizhou, showing a walled town with the mountains in the background in the grave sites of various families from the village on the mountains. People didn't bury people in walled towns in late imperial China. 
that would have broken the feng shui of the town. They needed to bury people in the mountains surrounding the villages. So what you're getting there is a, almost a visual of what this would look like on, um, on, on, a, on a local macro scale. Now with that understanding of, of the basics of what feng shui was in late imperial China, I just want to give a brief example of a legal case from Taiwan which can be considered a frontier of the Greater China region, a frontier of the Qing Dynasty. And this, this case comes from 1867 and highlights the importance of feng shui type knowledge in a local setting. Basically, more and more people were moving to Taiwan over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, establishing grave sites, establishing communities. In this, in this uh, inscription that we have, which was set up by the local county government, we see that the people of the village considered the origins of their village to be the Mai of a local mountain. This is very important. The Mai itself was the lifeblood of the village. The village was conceptualized as, as its origin being a vein. It was, in a way, alive. And during the course of the 19th century, probably population density was getting higher in Taiwan, and a number of people were attempting to cut down trees on, the, on these mountains. So the people of the village who, who, who believed that this mountain was being was was being affected by this process went to the local county government on several occasions they went first in the early 19th century and the yamen of course came out the local county government came out and set up an edict and protected uh, the mountain and said you cannot cut down trees because it would compromise the mai and it happened again in the 1860s uh, again what we're seeing here is that the local government acknowledges the feng shui language and is willing to protect the village, protect the villages who see their origins in the Mai itself. So with this case in mind uh, from Taiwan, we return to the place previously mentioned when discussing Sichuan province in western China's bureaucratic structure. Langzhong was the base of Baoning Prefecture in northern China. To the north of the walled county town, there existed a famous mountain. According to the local gazetteers and other records of the county and prefecture, this mountain, Panlongshan, in Chinese, um, had a, has a really famous history pretty much going all the way back to the Tang Dynasty. So, for instance, 8th, 9th century. Um, during the 17th century, people took a real notice, people took a real interest in the veins of this mountain and how they affected the county town of Langzhong. This may have been because of an earthquake and people were thinking about ways to respond and ways to prevent future earthquakes. It's hard to say. One would have to do further study on this subject specifically. But what we know is that during the 17th century, in order to protect the vein of the mountain, much as the Taiwanese in the previous case did the vein of the mountain for their village, the locals built a tower known as the Phoenix Tower in the county town of Longzhong. Now the Phoenix Tower was basically what we could today call a feng shui tower. It exists to protect the mai, uh, the, the veins of a, of a particular mountain or place from being disturbed. So what we're seeing here is, in other records, poems, etc., reflect this, is that the very fortune of the town itself was thought to be linked to this mountain. You know, this, again, isn't unique to this portion of Sichuan. You'd see this all over China, and again, we can see this all the way over to uh, Taiwan. So the important thing here, again, is People are resorting to the feng shui language to talk about the well-being of the town. So with this background of the Panlong Mountain and the Phoenix Tower in mind, I think we can come now to really the most interesting example from the local history of Langzhong of migration and feng shui coming together in a case study involving a local Muslim community. During the 17th century, as we've seen, Sichuan became uh, started to see massive immigration into the province. 
That also included immigration of Sufi orders coming in from Central Asia after the Ming Qing transition. And it was during this time that a sheikh of the Qadriya Sufi order, the, the Qadriya Sufi Tariqa, uh, Hoja Abd Allah, uh, arrived in Sichuan and was really traveling around. He, was, he wasn't just going to Sichuan, he was also traveling to other places. But he came to Langzhong and really fell in love with it. And he decided to spend the rest of his days uh, in Langzhong teaching. Upon his death, the local Muslim community decided to build him a, a very prominent gravesite. And with the help of the local community, the local gentry, and the local government, some, of, some, some members of the local government were probably Muslims themselves, they actually set out to build a gravesite on the Panlong Mountain. Now, as we've seen, the Panlong Mountain had a vein, it had a mai that went down and protected and brought fortune to the walled town of Longzong. So in order to do this, the Muslim community wrote up a contract, and again, I, I, I don't put the contract up here because it's, it's too long, but it, the contract itself invokes the feng shui language. It says that the, the Muslim community and the sheikh, the hoja himself, was uh, acknowledged the existence of the Mai, and that by building the shrine in the mountain, the Muslim community would take it upon themselves to protect the Mai. Uh, and, and what you see in the, in, the, in the pictures in this slide here is an image of the shrine as it appears today, which is much as it would have appeared in late imperial China, as well as on the right, the symbol of the shrine, which is a classic feng shui symbol. You see the mountains, the, the running water, and the trees in the background there. So we really see the Muslim community mobilizing the feng shui language in order to build a shrine on a very prominent mountain. You could think back to the Taiwan case study where we, could, where we saw how sensitive the issue of mountains were. And really, this is, a, this is a, I, I think, a real success story of how the language of feng shui was mobilized by a, mi a migrating group to the area in order to gain social acceptance by the local community. As I, as I previously mentioned, the shrine of the Babas was many things to many people. And the subject of migration and movement circulation really comes into relevance here on a few different levels. Of course, as we'll see just very shortly, the Baba Su was a local shrine to the people who were living in the county town of Longzhong. It was just a local shrine that appeared alongside the local landscape of other, of other shrines, it might be Buddhist, Taoist, etc. To the members of the Kadariya order, um, it was part of a greater network that stretched across northwest China. As you can see in this map here, uh, I've given you the location of the Babas in relation to the other shrines of the order. The movement between these shrines is, could be characterized as a form of circulation within the order. Uh, typically, what happens is, is every three years, a group of disciples sent from Gansu, which is the province just to the north of Sichuan, that holds many of the shrines of the order. They go to; they're assigned to one of the one of the many shrines across northwest China. So, for instance, if they're sent to the Baba Su, they'll they'll be there. They'll guard the Baba Su. Um, they'll receive pilgrims, do gardening upkeep, and of course handle any legal issues that might arise, uh, just locally. And then after those three years, they'll move on to another shrine. Eventually, they, they might have a chance to graduate, go back home, complete their studies, and possibly become a sheikh uh, themselves if, if they continue um, that, that far along in their studies. So this is just to, again, highlight that the shrine itself operates on these different levels. Feng Shui becomes important in understanding how the shrine when it goes from being part of this greater... Uh, larger network into the local landscape of Langzhong County. Now how for instance do we know what the reception of the Babasa was to the locals of the county in which it was immediately located, Langzhong County? Well there's a few ways to go about showing this 
And I thought one of the one of the one of the most readily available ways would be to show you, for instance, this poem, these poems written by the local non-Muslim literatist Shah Jilin, uh, who was a uh, probably a person of, of wealthy means, uh, who attained a, a great deal of education in his life, and wrote poems about many places within Lamjong County. And as we can see in this pair of poems here, he's got one uh, ode in praise of the prefix repairing of the Phoenix Tower. Now we've previously introduced the Phoenix Tower. The Phoenix Tower is significant in the history of Longjong because it was thought to ground the, the, the vein of Panlongshan in, in the county town. It protected the vein. It was something of a feng shui tower. And so it, it, it played an important function. Now, of course, when poets write poems about these things, they won't necessarily delineate every function of, of, of what they're, what they're writing about. And here he uses very poetic language to, of course, praise the prefect for rebuilding the tower. In the, in the corresponding poem, The Ode to the Baba Si, he, he does something uh, similar. In the, in the first line of this poem, you note that he notes that the Baba Si, of course, is on Panlong Mountain. Uh, and he, he has obviously traveled to the shrine, and he's admired its elegance. He has examined its, its, its various inscriptions, its, its various calligraphic panels. And he's really, if you, if you will, again, connecting the vein, the mai, that is rooted in the town all the way back up to Panlongshan and in, in doing that, praising the Baba Si. So this is, again, significant because it's, this is not a source from the Muslim community. This is a source from the local literati community, the local gentry community. Again, some Muslims were part of that community, though, we have, though it appears that Shah Jilin was, was not, since he wrote poems about other Taoist and, and Buddhist temples also in the town. So again, what we're, what we're seeing here is that feng shui didn't always matter for everything, but it did matter in the case of bringing in this cemetery site into the local landscape of Longtong. So I know I've covered quite a bit of ground in this, in this brief presentation, so I'll just wrap up here by highlighting what I hope are the three major points to, to bring home and to possibly expand on in further research. Understanding migration movement in space in late imperial China means moving beyond the map of the state, the administrative geography, and engaging with how local spaces and geographies were conceived by local people. The uses of feng shui in late imperial China have been understudied. Feng shui language is important for understanding how migration worked, particularly in how new arrivals to an area could establish their lineages in their new homes. You could extend this example, for instance, to the Baba Si, to the great Islamic shrine established in Longjong County, where the, where the Muslim community used feng shui language in order to acquire a very, very prominent piece of land within the county and how they were able to basically get acceptance uh, among the local, uh, local community for doing so. Building on this, contrary to popular perception, feng shui was not just a Chinese thing in the sense of just a thing of the Han people. It actually thrived on frontier regions where space was both flexible and contested. Our case studies from Taiwan and Sichuan definitely are a, uh, are a preliminary uh, series of cases that go in that direction. And I think future cases from Manchuria, Mongolia, Xinjiang, other Chinese border regions will come to support that conclusion. Finally, future studies can look at the links between how feng shui and history work both for and against moving populations. On one hand, feng shui provided a flexible framework that protected grave sites and could be used to accommodate newcomers. On the other hand, feng shui was also used to protect sites from potential threats, like imperialists in the 19th and early 20th century. And again, that's a much bigger discussion. Uh, it's a very interesting one, for instance, when, uh, when the British wanted to uh, build railroads in the country, the, the lo local people would cite feng shui dragon veins 
uh, in the destruction or, or, or breaking of the veins as a reason not to build the railroads. Um, again, that's something that could in the future be built upon. And finally, it might have very well been the utility of feng shui that made it so controversial among the early 20th century stapleholders of China, particularly the communists. And this is, of course, related to how feng shui was potentially a vehicle in a language for expressing ideas of property rights. Okay, well, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, please send any comments or questions to my email address. And once again, thank the organizers of the conference for giving me an opportunity to participate, even though I'm uh, far away. So thank you so much.